Excellent. Right. Here we go. Good. This is me putting a face. Uh, hi, everybody. We are live back on Facebook, I hope. It tells me that we are. So um, uh, we're a little bit early, but um, come on in and uh, please say hi. So I know there's people there for us. Uh, I'm just going to just check on. Uh, hi, Victoria. Hi, Andy. Hope you're OK. I'm good, thank you. I'm just checking. <laughs> yeah, to say that we're live. Oh, yeah. I'm just yeah. looking on my phone as well. Yeah, so we are, we're in, we're live. Oh, my God, it's working. That's really amazing. Brilliant. Well, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we've got viewers there. Good. Uh, please say hi in the comments. Um, so this is me returning back to Facebook uh, for our lives, because now I've worked out how to how to do it. Um, those who'd like to consume content on, on uh, YouTube, this will be uploaded to YouTube. So hi to anybody who's watching on YouTube. Uh, and please subscribe to the channel. So, Victoria, great to see you. We've got people saying hi. Yes, great. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Doreen. Um, hi, Keisha. Nice to see you all. Uh, and that's great. Good. Well, welcome along, Victoria. We, we were supposed to do this before I had to take a bit of time out. Yeah. So thank you for bearing with us. Uh, that's okay. It's, it's a really, really important um, conversation we're going to have tonight. We're going to be thinking about um, supporting doodle mixes and what that means but before we get into that then victoria um hi everybody great everybody's coming in everything's working this excellent is, this is extra cool because anybody who follows me on my personal timeline knows that i'm like oh i've worked it all out and i'll help you all to find out how to do it and i was thinking victoria if we couldn't get on tonight that's not a great i know <laughs> and i need you to teach me how so i can speak in my groups as well because uh, i don't know how to do it either so <laughs> Yeah, so it took, it took me a bit of a A lot of the videos are out there on this stuff. I don't know whether it's because people, especially on YouTube, because they're getting paid for um, advertisements. How can we make a minute's worth of content last an hour? Yeah, exactly. And so you have to really kind of deep dive in. But yeah. hi, everybody. We've got people coming from all over the world. We've got Canada. Uh, but, uh, yeah, a couple of, oh, we've got quite a bit in from Canada this evening. Well, welcome, Canada. Uh, good. And we, um, towards the end, Please ask some questions for Victoria towards the end. I'll let you know when the best time is to do that. But do share your thoughts as you go, because we can see those and uh, and we can always come back to them later. Victoria, so it's great to see you. Um, uh, let's start off then, as, as I like to, with you sharing with us a little bit about your own journey into working with dogs and your own sure. um, awareness that's come over the time. Okay. Um, so uh, in brief, so I was born in London. I'm 62 years old. So I was born in London in 62. And at the age of um, 10 years old, my mum emigrated to Brazil. And I grew up in Brazil, uh, in Rio de Janeiro to start with. And then in my later teens, we had a cattle farm in the mountains outside Rio. So I came back to England a couple of times uh, for school and family things and then went back to Brazil and I stayed there until I was nearly 30 and had a daughter there, got married, etc. In that time, I was um, heavily involved with all animals. I'd always had a passion for animals and always wanted horses and dogs and so on. And um, so I was heavily involved with the animals on the farm. I had working dogs, I had horses. And it became very clear to me how um, how welfare was an issue in Brazil, certainly at the time. And there was quite a lot of cruelty towards animals. Um, and so when I came back to England, I started getting involved with dog charities and I did puppy walking for Guide Dogs for the Blind. And I had several puppies that I, uh, I think they call it puppy fostering now, not puppy walking. And I also had reject and retired dogs. And it was a reject dog that had been rejected from East Midlands Police and from guide dogs and from various other organisations that set me on the path of dog training. And the reason for that is I went to local dog training classes and was really horrified at the abuse that I was seeing in the classes with lots of physical corrections and body slamming dogs on the floor and, you know, stressed out animals. So I started doing some investigations and um, found out about the APDT, 
found out about a course in Nottingham in, uh, in the Agricultural College there um, and did that. It was a three-year diploma in canine behaviour and training. It doesn't exist now, but it was a very good course in its time. And I also went to America. I've got family in America. I, I had the good fortune to go and speak to Gene Donaldson and Ian Dunbar and various people who at the time were leading the way in force-free training. And, um, and I started training my own dogs using less aversive methods. So I guess at the time I probably was a balanced trainer. So I did use corrections. And as I uh, developed my knowledge and awareness of dog behavior, then I became more and more um, sort of welfare based, consent based, um, care orientated rather than task driven and obedience training and so on. So that was, what was that, 1993, 94, that's when I joined the APDT and I ran a successful dog training business for, um, well, it's 30 years this year. Um, and I sold that business last year to my business associates and now I just do behavior. Um, but it, with the with the interest in doodles, that came about purely by chance. I took on a little doodle myself, a rescue, and she had a lot of behavior problems. Um, she was afraid of men. She couldn't be groomed or clipped. She was afraid of all the tools and implements. She had resource guarding. Um, she was generally quite an anxious dog. She's 10 years old now. Um, and so she taught me an awful lot about learning to read these doodles or crossbreeds, whatever you want to call them. And as a result of my knowledge in helping her, and then also an increase in seeing clients with cockapoos and um, poodle crosses, it, uh, my knowledge and awareness of them as a breed type has increased quite significantly. So I do see a lot of them now in my day-to-day -day work. So that's yeah, my yeah, story. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I just want to touch on a couple of things actually, because mm, we're going to go into the doodle mixes in a minute. And you very kindly put together a presentation for us, which we'll share, hopefully, really testing my tech skills tonight, Victoria. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think it's really cool to speak to somebody, you know, 30 years, 30 years in this business. That is something, you know, you know, I feel like I need to give you a gold watch or something. You know? <laughs> um, because I think we should really celebrate that. And uh, um, you know, I, I'm coming up to 15 years with my kind of uh, business. And even in that time, I've just seen huge changes in our community, yeah. how we work, how things yeah. happen, let alone 30 years. So um, that's a real value for us all, I think, to kind of tap into that. And um, do you feel that that kind of notion of maybe that care orientated thing that you're talking about, which is part of all of our evolution, really, did you feel that that was quite inherent in you anyway? Because you said that even when you went to those early things, you thought this doesn't feel right. That's abusive. Yeah, I so think where, so. Where, where do you think that came from for you? As I think, I mean, uh, even as a small child, I remember even as a, you know, three, four year old being desperately drawn towards animals and wanting to look after them. So I was a child who picked up strays, who, who rescued fledglings, who even rescued snails and had a snail garden in the garden and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think it was very much part of me of looking after animals. And to some extent, I do have um, I have run quite a few social groups for um, disadvantaged people and for women. And so I think that is something in me that I do care about people generally, as well as animals. Um, as you know, I run a successful group for professionals which is over a thousand members in it and that's all about support and care for each other so I do think that's an intrinsic part of me really caring I think also certainly Brazil and I don't know what it's like now but there was a big culture clash um, I was married and I was um, uh, married into a, a, an abusive relationship so again that was very difficult for me my my ex-husband was a farmer and was quite cruel to animals so that really did um I found that very difficult you know and so that's something that when I got when I left Brazil it was really important to me not to be around anybody that abused animals that that did leave some deep scars on me I have to say so yeah that did definitely direct my way of learning I think well, thank you for sharing that with us, Anna. And I think um, 
I put a post out today just talking about recognizing that <clears throat> this shift from task to care does involve a certain amount of letting go of our own expectations and some of the things that we're kind of indoctrinated in. And, and what's interesting for me is how many people through their own personal experience. So I, I think about myself as a member of the LGBTQ community and how mm -hmm. we've been, we've had our own struggles to move away from having to fit some conformist norm and really understanding that people yeah. who experienced uh, sadly being in abusive relationships or those insecure attachments, people who um, have experienced a community around them that doesn't recognize their own innate safety needs and they're expected to somehow perform to to meet the, those external expectations mm -hmm. we kind of feel it anyway actually I think and we we find our way through that and how we work with dogs and our and our mm -hmm. clients actually and so it becomes a quite a personal thing actually not just a professional yeah thing. yeah yeah just two just one second Andy hang on hmm. Husband's just taking the dog out, so I can hear everything he's saying to her. <laughs> uh, do you know I was I was doing was recording a podcast with somebody today, and I was I was looking after my friends with the Afghan hounds, which people may know. But um, all three Afghans decided to come and give me a big kiss at the time, so I was just kind of <laughs> lost in Afghan hounds. Uh, so yeah, that's the reality of doing these things, isn't it? But um, okay, great. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Victoria. And I okay. think I think it is important because. All everybody I've spoken to on this platform, really, there is either a person who has really influenced them and inspired them to have that mindset shift, or there is something very ingrained in their own personal story that comes out in that process, actually, that drives that push, which is, um, and sometimes both, of course, both things can happen. Yeah. Right. So shall we, um, let's get into doodles then, into doodle mixes. Doodles. Um, and uh, this is, I'm really interested in this because I think speaking to friends, behaviorists, uh, groomers, veterinary, virtually every sector has identified that there are some extra challenges here. Yeah. And um, and I think the general public, especially, they, they need more awareness of these things because they've already got the usual handicaps, if you want to call them that, of thinking about dogs dominating them and obedience and all these kind of things, let alone yeah. that they think they've got this little teddy bear that's come into their house or something that's right. like it, um, that actually has um, many of them, some of them, don't know which way, how you'd want to quantify that, but do have some specific challenges. So we're going to explore that. So I'm really interested in this. Do you want to go in, would it be helpful to go into the, um, the presentation first then? Or do you want yes, to go we to can do. Things? No, yeah, we can do. I'll do that. Um, yeah, on that subject of the challenges. So those, so when I got Daisy, I wasn't aware of the challenges myself. Like I say, she's 10 years old now. And we had a lot of them coming into puppy classes and they were cute and fluffy and fun and athletic and all of that. You know, you saw all those nice size, those cute size of them. Getting Daisy was a big eye opener. Um, and that's what the problems she had are the common problems that I'm seeing, you know, every day, really, with my clients, with their um, doodle crosses, whatever cross you want to, yeah. to um, mention. So, yeah, so I've done a, a short presentation. It's a little bit wordy, so I will let people read the screens, but um, I will. There we go. Um, I just want to find the hang on. Oh, good, that's oh. nicely as well. That's good. Hang on, let me just. I want to try and get the um, right, just bear with me a second. I want to try and get it from the first screen. And I can't because the Zoom's covering it. Just hold on a sec. <laughs> Wait a minute. Just one second. <laughs> right. Oh, flipping heck. That's the problem with technology. You can't actually... I can't get the presentation up from... Um, screen one i'll have to do it manually i think okay and also if you i think if you press escape when you do the kind of share with zoom if you press escape it'll you can make your window smaller you know resize it so you can see what's behind it uh 
uh, it's because I've got the um, thing at the top. There we go. Right. Right. That should be it. How does that look, your end? Yeah, it looks great. It's okay. Really nice. Okay. So um, the myths, misconceptions and misunderstandings of doodle crossbreeds. Um, most people know them as doodles. So we're talking a wide variety of poodle crosses. So I'm, I'm focusing mainly on cockapoos in this little presentation, but I will talk about the other crossbreeds as well. So um, I guess it's quite obvious that the cocker poo is a cocker spaniel cross poodle, um, which are two working breeds of dog with particular breed traits. And they were originally bred to do um, gun dog work originally. Um, but there's also the Labradoodle as well, which I'll talk about later. Um, so from the public's point of view, the Cockapoo is a delightful, cuddly, fluffy, cute, Disney, characterful, small dog and is quite appealing to people uh, because they um, are generally small in size. A lot of people think that they are um, don't shed their fur. They're hyper, they, there's this thing about being hypoallergenic. Um, but underneath that fluffy exterior, there is a very unique personality, and it is the personality of the, and the traits of those two working breeds. So the genetic behaviours of these dogs are sculpted by the genes and the breeding and the traits of those two very strong purebred dogs, which is a cock spaniel and the poodle, or the Labrador and the Poodle or whatever other Poodle cross we're looking at. And I think that's the bit that um, people really struggle with. The, in my experience, most of the people who acquire a Cockapoo, they don't really understand Cocker Spaniels or Poodles for that matter. So um, it's often a bit of a shock to the system when they have this cuddly little animal at home that starts showing quite strong Cocker traits or on the flip side, the poodle traits, which you know can be an anxious dog and a vocal dog and so on. So um, I'm just gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. So the Cock Spaniel, there's, there's three types of Cock Spaniel. There's the English show type, which most people are familiar with, which is the um, Lady and the Tramp type Cock Spaniel with the long ears. And the show type dog is historically bred for the show with the very long ears and the long feathery coat. Um, and is generally quite a placid nature. But as we know, those of us in the uh, um, profession of working with behaviour, we do know that there has been this questionable history about aggression in the cock spaniel, which used to be called cocker rage. Um, there is quite a lot of discussion about whether that was um, a, a real genetic abnormality or whether it was idiopathic aggression, in other words, had no known cause. Um, but whichever way you look at it, there was definitely a period of time in the Cocker's history where they did have quite a lot of aggression, particularly the solid colored dogs, so the red dogs and the black dogs. The American show Cocker Spaniel is less known in the UK. Perhaps it's been a little bit more familiar since they had a lot of winners in Crofts but um, it's not seen regularly around uh, in people's homes and on streets and parks and so on. It has a very long coat and needs, it's a very high maintenance coat unless it's clipped short. And in general, the American Cock Spaniel is much more placid than the English Cock Spaniel. And then you've got the working Cock Spaniel. So for anybody who understands gun dogs and working dogs, you'll know that there are two um, divide, there's a divided strains in the breed. So you have the working type Labrador and the show type Labrador, the working Springer, the show uh, Springer, and the same with the Cocker. So the working type Cocker, Cocker is a very small athletic dog. It's got very high energy. It's got very high prey drive. In other words, it is driven to hunt and search for birds much more um, uh, obsessively, if you like, than say a, than, say, a show dog. And what we know from the cockapoos is that they're typically bred by um, maybe naive breeders or um, puppy farms and so on. So they're not really looking at the temperament of the parents when they're breeding the cockapoo. 
and so quite a lot of cockapoos are bred from a working type cocker spaniel, which has got all these drives to go out and work and possess and search for birds and, and so on. So the cocker spaniel, the working cocker spaniel in a home, in a pet home, can become a problematic dog. And that's because its working drives are not being met and there isn't an outlet for that strong prey drive. Uh, also, owners don't necessarily understand the dog's desire to um, possess and obsess over articles and items. So what I find with most gun dogs and, and particularly spaniels is that they like to carry things in their mouths. And that in a pet home can become a problem because in general, and I am generalizing here, a lot of pet dog owners are trying to take things out of their dog's mouth and they're doing that from quite a young age with the puppies. So this then becomes um, a potential for resource guarding. So if, you, if your cockapoo has come from um, a background of working cock spaniel and poodle, then there's a long history of working dogs in their genetic history. And the owner might find that that dog has inherited a lot of those natural instincts. Um, also, what we know is that the cockapoo can be quite anxious depending on the poodle side of the genetic strain and they don't cope very well with isolation. They also can be quite demanding in that they need a lot of mental and physical stimulation. So the poodle characteristics, so again, there's three types of poodle, the standard, the miniature and the toy. A cockapoo is most likely bred from either the miniature or the toy types of spaniel, uh, sorry, poodle. Um, to match the spaniel size. The Labradoodle, which is a Labrador cross poodle, is often mated with a standard poodle. But again, you do sometimes get small Labradoodles as well. So again, the standard poodle was originally bred as a water gun dog that hunted and retrieved ducks. So again, they often have a, a strong prey drive. However, nowadays, most standard poodles are bred for the show ring or as companions. So their drives for hunting might not be as strong as the original working dogs. In my experience and the breed characteristics, I find that poodles are, can be quite aloof with strangers. They're very vocal. They're very alert to changes in the environment and they are quite anxious dogs in general. Now, I am generalizing. I'm sure there are some bomb proof poodles out there. Um, and I'm sure that those dogs do well in the show ring and agility and all the rest of it, but it very much depends on where they're bred from. Again, they don't cope well with uh, isolation. So other doodle crossbreeds, and this seems to become a bit of a, um, a joke or a game really to see what crazy doodle names can be invented with, depending on the cross. Um, you've got Labrador Cross Poodle, which is the Labradoodle, which was originally bred in Australia to be uh, a hypoallergenic guide dog. And there is some history there. I can't remember the name of the guy who originally um, put the two breeds together, but he has since said he regretted it because the breed has become... Um, uh, how can you say, maybe corrupted by enthusiasts, by how they want to keep them and, um, you know, what they want to do about early neutering and all of that. So that's a whole other story. We've got the Golden Retriever and Poodle, Golden Doodle, Multipoo, which is a Maltese cross poodle, Springer cross poodle, which is a Sproodle, Bernese Mountain Dog cross poodle, which is a Boodle, Border Collie cross poodle, Poodle, which is a boar doodle or a sheep -a doodle, and I'm currently working with one of those. Um, a Bichon cross poodle is a Bouchon. A Cavalier cross poodle is a Cavapoo, and and God knows what else. So you know, there's all sorts of mixes now with poodles. I'm not quite sure why people are doing this. I don't know if it's because they like the fluffy look. I don't know if it's because they think the dog is non-shedding, or whether it's purely to make money to have a crazy name and a cute picture, I really don't know. But they have earned the title designer dogs in the UK for that reason, because people are mixing poodles with anything and seeing what comes out. Um, and unfortunately, if people are breeding dogs for their looks, then we know that they can start propping up with temperament problems and health problems and so on. Sadly, because of their popularity, many of these crossbreeds are bred in puppy farms or by people who are solely 
um, driven by money to make money out of fluffy little pups rather than their welfare or their um, genetic heritage. So the common problems that I see associated with cockapoos and some other doodles is that they they can be anxious dogs. Now, whether this comes from the poodle nature or the spaniel nature, I don't know. In general, when I've worked with spaniels, they're fairly laid back, apart from having high drive for hunting and so on, whereas poodles can be highly strong. Poodles take a long time to warm up to strangers. So they, they, you know, quite loyal and affectionate with their own families, but they don't welcome outsiders very well. So sometimes that can come through in a cockapoo or a labradoodle. They're vocal dogs. The, one of the biggest problems that I am asked to work with with my clients is they are possessive. And that is from the cocker side of the, of the mix or, um, or maybe sometimes golden retriever side of the mix. So they are possessive over resources in general. And by that, I mean toys, sometimes food and locations. And um, because they're typically acquired by families who want a small fluffy dog for their children, um, this can become a problem very quickly because the new family can't read the dog and don't understand that the dog has got possessive aggression. They are hypersensitive towards touch, especially around the paws. They are hypersensitive towards grooming. Their coat needs an awful lot of maintenance. And if the wrong brushes are used when they're puppies, or if there's mats and snags in their coat, they become quite averse to being groomed and handled. They don't cope with isolation. And they're very hard to read their body language due to this heavy facial hair, which obscures their, their eyes and their mouth. So as I've mentioned, some of the doodle crosses are prone to anxiety. This will be due in part to genetics, but also depends on who breeds them. I know of two very good um, cockapoo breeders who take all the care that you'd expect from a good breeder, who do all the, the health screening, who uh, rear their puppies in an environment, environmentally stimulating place. Um, they get handled, you know, they're looked after properly. But I think those breeders are in the minority. I think in general, they've become victims of their popularity and their Disney looks. They are bred on puppy farms. They're bred by backstreet breeders. Um, and sometimes the parents of the pups, their needs are not being met as well. And then you get puppies that have got maybe inherited anxiety and so on. Um, a lack of early positive socialization is common from puppy farm dogs. They're, they're bred in isolation in sheds and barns. So when they go to their new home, they already have got a fear of, of novelty um, and they're anxious. So they probably start their lives at quite a disadvantage. Now I know that can happen with lots of other breeds. I'm not singling out the doodles on their own. I'm just saying that because of their um, cute fluffy appearance, they are being bred, mass bred in some situations, and a lot of them are at a disadvantage. So um, both breeds generally don't cope well with young children because young children, you know, are um, impulsive and noisy, and they might be grabbing at little puppies. They might not understand that it's a little animal. I think that in my experience, um, new dog owners are heavily influenced by social media, by celebrities, by what they see on TikTok. And so they don't really understand dogs and they can't read their cockapoo or their doodle because of the heavy coat. So there's a lot of um, situations there that can put the dog at a disadvantage from quite a young age um, and, you know, end up with behaviour problems. Then you've got health problems. So the most common health problems in the cocker is luxating patella, which is a slipping kneecap and hip dysplasia. Then they're also prone to cataracts and PRA. Uh, PRA is a, where the retina starts to atrophy as the dog matures, and that might not show up until the dog's maybe seven or eight years old. So sometimes dogs are being bred when they carry this gene. And, you know, because they're mature dogs, that they carry this gene, it's being passed on to successive litters. IVDD um, is a disease where the discs inside within the spine start to degenerate. 
and that causes pain and um, presses on the spinal cord. My own dog, Daisy, she had this. We didn't know this when we got her. And she jumped out of the car. I think we'd had her about two years. She jumped out of the car and she just screamed in agony and two discs in her neck had ruptured. Um, she had to have emergency surgery at an orthopedic surgeon's. Um, she had um, ventral slot surgery, which is where they go through the neck. Up, they put the dog upside down, they go through the neck, push the windpipe and so on out of the way to get to the discs in the spine. And they took the discs out. So she was in hospital about six days. And um, because she'd had a back problem prior to that, she wasn't insured for it. So that cost us £8,000. Um, and then after that, she had to have further MRI. So in total, it came to about £10,000 to fix her, her um, dodgy spine. And now at 10 years old, we're very careful with what she does. Um, a lot of dogs are prone to atopic allergies, so allergies caused by itchy skin and ear infections. They've obviously got the long droopy ears, so they're more prone to ear infections as well as other inherited conditions. And then with the poodles, again, a breed of dog that is prone to uh, inherited diseases. So again, you've got the luxating patella and the PRA. So that's two breeds of dogs with the same genetic problems. So that strengthens it in those crossbreeds. Epilepsy in poodles. Vo uh, bloat is common in dogs with a deep chest, with the poodles have got the very deep chest. Hip dysplasia, IBDD, and so on. So if you've got a very good breeder, they will be screening their breeding stock for these genetic diseases or as many as possible. And as I've already said, the vast majority of cockapoos and doodle crosses are bred by people who either don't know about genetic behaviors and genetic um, diseases or don't care one or the other um, because they're breeding the dogs purely for uh, financial gain rather than for the welfare of the animal. So, um, I mean, you know, just looking at that photo, they are so very cute when they're little. You can see how people fall in love with them and they are prone to that sort of Disney character. Um, so I think when people do get a cockapoo or a doodle puppy, you know, they are driven by this sort of look and really don't understand the, the actual behaviour of these puppies. So it's so important that they have early positive um, training and handling. The doodle will need a lot of coat maintenance. I've seen uh, some pretty awful photographs of dogs that are matted right down to the skin if they're neglected. And depending on the crossbreed, so Bernese cross with a poodle, the, the coat of a Bernese mountain dog is designed to protect it from harsh, harsh conditions and the poodle has got the curly coat and the two coats combined can end up matting together like a carpet and cause real pain and, and welfare issues for that dog. So again, this is because people don't understand the genetics of putting these breeds together and seeing what will come out. And so they need an awful lot of coat maintenance and they're going to need that from a very young age. And what, what I think happens is that people don't really do a lot of positive and consensual body handling when the puppy is young. They are picked up a lot. They're passed around a lot. They're, you know, treated more like a toy. So when they do need their grooming and their handling and they go to a groomer's at six, seven months, they're obviously averse to being handled. They've not had a lot of practice at being handled. They're put into a, a stressful situation with noise and other dogs. They're physically restrained, such as that one there in that in that lower photograph, maybe haven't been taught to be handled like that. Um, and so then they can start snapping and being um, defensive. And then if the breeder has got a busy day and lots of dogs to, to deal with. Then they put a muzzle on and it's a slippery slope basically because the dog is then associating the ballon with aversive methods and aversive tools. So for anybody listening to this who has a doodle, you need to be doing lots of gentle handling, you know, several times a week, three or four times a week and getting your dog used to being restrained gently, getting them used to noises, 
hair dryers and so on, um, scissors making the clipping sounds, all of that. Don't just wait for the groomer to do it. It's the, the groomer's job is just part of the picture. It's the owners and the guardians that need to be really looking after their dogs and making sure that the dog is happy in that environment. Now, I personally, I follow the fear-free consent-based grooming with Daisy. So she is she's groomed freely, she's groomed on the floor. Um, I was taking her to a groomer and she was terrified. She got to the point where she wouldn't even get out of the car. She was climbing my legs with fear. And so I put myself through a grooming course to learn how to do, to clip her. And so she's never obviously show perfect, but she is clipped and maintained for her health and her welfare. And that is all done freestanding on the floor. Um, I get the equipment out. I put a blanket down. She sits on the blanket. She gets lots of rewards. If she wants to walk away during that process, she's allowed to. She can do what she wants. She comes back. And I take her two or three days to groom her whole body, to clip her and use scissors and so on her because it's done gradually. Now, obviously, a, a professional groomer doesn't necessarily have time for that. But um, if, if you're struggling with your dog's um, grooming and handling, then you need to try and find a consent-based groomer. And there is a growing number of consent-based groomers who will really take their time and get to know your dog rather than thinking about grooming eight dogs in eight hours, for example, that, you know, they really are going to spend time just on the one dog. Obviously, that might be a premium service, but it does mean that your dog is not afraid or forced into situations um, just to make sure that the job is done. So you just want lots of short um, grooming sessions and handling sessions. And then the other really important uh, task, if you like, for your to, to teach your doodle is to swap and drop. So they will be very, very possessive. Um, they will want to feel things in their mouth. They are orally obsessed with holding and collecting and seeking. And that's not something that we can take out of the dog and neither should we want to. If, if we're going to have these breeds of dog that have uh, behavioral traits that are very strong we need to work with that dog rather than against it and that means teaching it that um, it is allowed to pick things up that it's going to be encouraged to pick things up and bring them to you that you're going to um, give that item back that you're not going to be chasing after your dog and forcing their mouth open to pull things out of its mouth um, you need to work from a very young age to really um, encourage your dog to carry things and to trade them in with you. Uh, this is uh, when I didn't mention in my history, but I did a lot of gun dog work when I was learning to be a dog trainer. So I worked Labradors. Um, and the first thing we do with all the puppies, even at four or five weeks of age, is if they pick things up is to give them lots of encouragement and try and teach them that bringing the thing to us is a safe place and that we're going to do a trade. And so you're working with the natural traits of the gun dog breed that wants to carry gifts to you and hold things and parade things in the mouth, walking around parading and so on. Um, but the, one of the problems or, or adding to the problems that we have with the doodles is that, again, people don't understand these behavioral traits. They worry if the puppy's picked up a sock or a dishcloth, they run after it. They force the puppy to let go. They might squeeze its mouth to make it let go of something. Children might run after it, force the puppy to let go of their own toys. And this very quickly develops into possessive aggression. And that's one of the main reasons why people consult me with their doodles. Um, partly because they've got possessive aggression with a bite history and also they don't want to be touched. So they've got the grooming and sort of touch aversion that's going on as well. So there is two videos here. I don't know if the volume is going to come through. So I'm going to press press play, Andy, and then if you tell me if the volume goes, um, or sorry, if you can hear it. If you can't, then I'll talk through it. You don't want to go to bed. Can't see the video, Victoria. Can only hear. Can't see it. 
Yeah, it's probably because you're sharing the PowerPoint screen. You'll have to share the video screen now, I think. Oh. Your, your video player. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Not sure how to do that. If you shut, if you stop, if you've got your video window open, um, if you stop sharing screen and then share screen again, it will give you an option to pick that video, perhaps. No, I've embedded it into the presentation. Oh, I see. I got you. Um, let me see if. If not, I can put it in your group afterwards. Mm. Hang on, let me see if the other one will share. Sorry. So I just want to think that um, people can check out um, uh, talking about rumors and consent based stuff. Sue Williams' son, of course, with her taking the group. Yeah. Group, yeah, um, Steph Zickerman as well Steph with Zickman, um, yeah. grooming, and um, <clears throat> they're but they're both great educators, and they both have books out, of course. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, this is really good stuff, Victoria. I, I think um, uh, this is going to be something that I I think a lot of professionals will want to share to their clients to give them a bit of an educational. Actually, I think it's really good uh, information for them to to understand <clears throat> more. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's a growing problem. I mean, they're, they're incredibly popular dogs now. I, I used to, you know, people used to call them designer dogs. And now I say to Daisy, you're as common as muck, basically. You're just a mongrel. <laughs> In fact, mongrels are more rare, to be honest, than a cockapoo. Um, so, but yeah, they're, they're incredibly popular, aren't they? Because I think because their size and appearance and they don't, you know, their coat apparently doesn't shed. I mean, just see if this plays i don't know if it will hang on <coughs> excuse me can you see that um i can oh, see yes. a box that still says do not try this at home with the google link so you can't see the video that i've clicked on no, oh, no. It? Okay. okay what i'll do is i'll put it in the chat in this thread afterwards it's actually um some people might have already seen it it's a cockapoo on a sofa in america and the dog is giving all of the signs of do not disturb me and the lady is laughing and keeps reaching for the dog and the dog is escalating and escalating with its communication and the lady is just laughing and mm -hmm. so it's one of these TikTok videos that's doing the rounds mm -hmm. and people think it's funny because the dog is showing its teeth and growling and the lady is saying, oh, come on, you need to go to bed and et cetera. And I, I just think this is the problem. I know there are there are a lot of videos like that of other breeds. So for example, Rottweilers showing all their teeth and people think that's funny and think the dog's talking to them. But I do think that the more Disney-like the dog is, the less serious they take them. And mm -hmm. what I find with my work is that I'm sure you've got the same problem, Andy, is that most people who have a dog, they don't know the early warning signs of the dog feeling uncomfortable. They, they haven't, they, they don't, even if they've got a smooth-coated dog like a Jack Russell, they don't understand about the whale eye, they don't understand about the whiskers sticking out. They don't understand about the pursed, tense mouth. They don't know the avoidance signs. They don't know any of that. And so the dog is escalating all the time with its message. But with the cockapoo or the doodle, you can't see any of those early warning signs. They have to be quite obvious in their communication. They have to escalate quite quickly with showing all their teeth or growling or snapping because the fringes are obscuring their eyes. The hair is obscuring the whiskers. You can't see the hackles go up. You can't see anything. You know, it's just this bundle of curly coat. So I think that's possibly why there's we see a lot of aggression in cockapoos and doodles because they their early warning signs have been ignored, ignored, ignored. So they have to escalate really quickly and snap and lunge and get their message across because they've not been heard or paid attention to with those early levels of communication. I think that's a really, really good point, <clears throat> because when you think about it, <clears throat> this is where the general public, I think, are being let down. 
<clears throat> with a very task orientated approach anyway. Yeah. Um, and um, the lower signals, they don't know what they are. The no. higher signals, they see that as being disobedient or being right. dominant naughty. Or or naughty. Yeah. So they might like to get shut down. So it's the worst of both worlds, really, I yeah. think. And I think also, especially with the cockapoos, <clears throat> um, I'm, <laughs> my husband, Kieran, I, he, he jokes because I'm not really, but he says, you're a bit triggered by cockapoos, aren't you? <laughs> um, and it's only because when I when I pick up the phone and it's a cockapoo, I think, yeah, there's going to be either a separation issue, guarding issue, handling issue. <clears throat> you kind of or know all three. <laughs> all three. And often in the home of somebody who might be <clears throat> a first time dog owner. That's right. The young family think they're going to have an easiest dog. Yeah. Um, somebody who's maybe had other breeds and they're maybe in retirement and they think we'll have an easier breed. That's right. And um, so it's a bit of a shock. That's right. That's exactly what's happening. And I love in your presentation how you cover so many different things about the physical, the emotional, the genetic, all these kind of things. The physical side for me, you know, um, what's interesting, uh, I've um, had a pain specialist from Langford get involved in a lot of the cases I get involved with. Yeah. And of the current seven yep. that I've got her in, four are cockapoos. Yeah. All with kind of myofascial, neuropathic yeah, stuff, stuff. That's right. So there's a connection here as well. And I think without my wonderful colleague, Kate Davy, who's the, the local animal physio, uh, even the vets oversee some of this stuff. And it's Kate who identifies, yeah, this dog's really struggling. So it's no wonder yeah. they struggle with grooming. They struggle with handling. They don't want to harness that's right. And I, I've got a, a very uh, well-respected and trusted colleague locally who's a chartered veterinary um physiotherapist she's fantastic but sometimes when I meet a dog for the first time and I can see something off with the way it's moving and I refer it to Sarah and I say I'm not sure there's something about the gate or there's something about the back you know and again hard to read with all that dense fur um, send it to Sarah and sure enough she'll find you know luxating patella or hip dysplasia or a sprained back or any number of things so yeah, you're right. And it's it's sad, really, because, I mean, we see it so much, not just with cockapoos, but we see it with horses. We see it with lots of animals that they're trying to communicate with us about how they feel and they're ignored or they're punished for how they feel. And yeah. it's incredibly sad to see this. And, you know, your wonderful group, a lot of people in the group are more enlightened. They're more invested in the care of the animal and, and having a a loving, trusting relationship with their animal, but you know, us professionals were constantly battling against the dark side. Um, that you know, the dog has to walk to heal and the dog has to do this. And if it doesn't, I'll strangle it or I'll choke it or I'll kick it or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's very, very sad. Very sad. So if we think about the doodles then, <clears throat> um uh we've got about 10 minutes or so left, I think, to to think yeah. about um if anybody's got any questions, by the way, pop them in the chat because if i see them i can ask i can ask victoria but they will be there and we'll have a little look later but so how do you go about working with the clients then so i guess the first thing really is to support that awareness of what they're actually having and that has some challenges doesn't it i think yes it's yes so, uh, tr i do try and explain the background traits of the breeds that they've got so one of my clients at the moment they went to wales on holiday they came back with a sheepdog cross poodle and the, the dog, apparently the farmer decided to breed his working sheepdog, Welsh sheepdog, to the village poodle. Um, and he's done it a few times. And the lady, the owner says, yeah, you know, he does this to make money, I guess. And she was quite candid about it. But that dog is living in an urban environment and she is much more collie, working collie, than she is poodle. And she struggles. She struggles a lot with movement. She struggles with noise. She's stimulated by the environment. She lives in with a busy household that's moving around and so on. So my, I, I do explain breed traits and I do explain that, you know, we will help the dog to adapt to living with them. But obviously you have to also accept that this is the breed they've got. This is the dog that they've chosen. So, you know, they do have to accept a dog is a dog is a dog as well. They're not Disney characters. They do have needs and they do have drives that make them behave in certain ways. So I, th I think sometimes when I sit down and explain to them these things, it does help them because they instead of 
them thinking, oh, this dog is naughty and all these negative labels, they start realizing that the dog was designed to do a certain job. And then especially if I can start showing them how to get the dog engaged in something such as free work or you know, scent work or anything like that, that can really sort of almost help them to take pride in the dog and see, oh, my dog is really clever at, at whatever, you know. And do you find that frustration is a big thing for these dogs? I think it depends on the on the the, the cross. So certainly the ones crossed with collies, yeah, very high level of frustration, and the working spaniels. Yeah, and that's interesting because I was talking to I can't remember who I was speaking to now. Um, who, who was I talking to? Anyway, I can't remember who it was. Um, uh, sorry if you're listening, but um, that, <laughs> that there used to be more of a more of a um a tendency with the cockapoos to have kind of show cock show uh, cockers and uh, poodles and yeah. then because of some of the health stuff the 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 the, the bias now seems to be more towards working, working yeah and that's a whole world of difference isn't it that's right yeah yeah the fizzy little dogs that want to do 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 work 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 very intelligent very driven you know excel at their job as working young dogs or even excel at agility but in a pet home, especially with children with stuff all over the place, you know, the dog has to understand he can't have this, he can't have that. Well, at least that's what they want him to understand. Um, so, yes, it, is, it isn't It is easy. And sadly, I have known cases that have been rehomed, um, but they have gone to either people who want to work the dog and, you know, it's turned out OK because the dog's needs have been met. Yeah. Um, but it's finding that happy middle ground that the dog stays in its home and its needs are met in the home it's in. It's quite a learning curve, isn't it, for the caregiver? As I say, that they didn't sign up for that necessarily when they were yeah. taken off. And that, that, that's the that's the frustration I see a lot with the um, with the cockapoos. I think is that they're, they're trying to get relief for stuff that might be physical or emotional. And they're not getting exactly. It. They're trying to find an outlet for their. There are things that, you know, part of their own kind of positive hedonic budget, if you like, isn't being yeah. met. So yeah. um, it's, it's quite it's quite a thing. And uh, we need more looking into it, really, from a study point of view, I think, because it's mm. just so well known. I was talking at the London Vet Show last November and talking to vets. Cockapoos kept coming up again. Yeah. Because even the veterinary have found that they're, 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 they have their challenges within that. We've got um, uh, quite a few comments here from... Uh, from groomers in the thingy hi to the compassionate groomer thank you for contributing with so many things here and and how difficult these things are and um uh well you know this has been really really um uh, helpful victoria okay. and uh, i i love how you've managed to present to us so many different important factors for the doodle breeds yeah and thank you so much for taking time to give us a presentation that's okay. That's you're welcome. I, really I think in, in the right homes, they make great dogs. Before Daisy had her IVDD surgery, we did agility, we did scent work. We still do scent work at home, but, you know, I don't do anything that involves a lot of scrambling around for her. She did parkour. Um, we do parkour now mainly for to keep her core strength up, to protect her back. Um, but yeah, I mean, for, if you want a small dog with a coat that doesn't shed, but you're willing to put the work in, then they're great. You know, a dog <laughs> wants to do scent work, agility, all those things, but they're definitely not couch potatoes. I think this is <laughs> one point you mentioned there, because I was going to say, if you get a collie, you know what you're going to get. But we know that sadly there's a lack of awareness broad, broadly anyway. Yeah. But generally you think, I'm going to get a Labrador. I'm gonna get so you kind of get what get. Yeah. I think this double whammy of people not knowing what they're going to get so they they aren't aware so they can't do the early stuff that's right uh, and then we've got this bigger problem and i think it is worth mentioning that when we talk about anything from a breed point of view there is has to be an element of generalization you know that's the point but we have to be aware of some of the potential challenges and the more that we can be aware of that as professionals the more we can support the clients and the and the general public to be that but the, but there is just a well known um recognition that there is something about these breed combinations that create some of these tricky things um yapley hi yapley uh do you think australian uh, labradoodles have different <laughs> traits and it's Say that again. do you think australian labradoodles have different traits and interestingly i've got two australian 
Labradoodles on my books at the moment. And, and the, the caregivers have both been kind of persuaded that somehow that makes them different and they're actually not that anymore because they're this and that. And the, but I think that's a clever bit of the packaging around them. Marketing, uh, yeah. Them. I think that, I mean, I, th I think it's a whole other subject, the La Australian Labradoodles. I, I know certainly in Australia, there's some questionable um, practices around them uh, where they have um, prepubescent neutering and so on, which, you know, the science world shows us, the veterinary world shows us how dangerous that is and how wrong that is from, you know, from the dog's point of view of its uh, welfare and its physicality and so on. So, I mean, that's just one whole subject on its own. Neutering puppies at eight weeks old is just just wrong. I can't say any other way about it. It's just wrong. Um, the Australian Labradoodles I've worked with, I have found them to be very anxious. Now, whether that's because of the early neutering, I suspect that has a lot to, uh, you know, with it. Um, they are more aloof dogs. So whether the poodle side is a lot stronger than the Labrador side, uh, the ones I've worked with are quite aloof with strangers. But I, I've not had a lot of Australian Labradoodles, and I think it might be because the cockapoo overtook it in terms of popularity. And I think there is a core group of Labradoodle breeders who are under that Australian Labradoodle banner that they're trying to make it a purebred dog. I think they're trying to aim to make it a purebred dog. So it's, you know, quite a close circle. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, great. Well, thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much. And as I, say, I really appreciate your, um, your sharing your knowledge with us and, and giving such an excellent presentation. I think uh, this is definitely... Um, a talk I'll be sending my own clients to uh, who have the doodle mixes. And I think it's such a, a rich resource for people, I think, professionals. So thank you for that. You're welcome. There is a there is a support group for owners. And I've also got the consent-based groomers in there. Um, it's called uh, Cockapoo and Doodle Behaviour Support. So if anybody wants to join that, I talk mm -hmm. in that regularly and I share things in there. Um, that's grown very quickly, actually. Do I get you to put, a link to put that link into the comments? Yeah, will do. So when I put this up on YouTube, I'll make sure those links are there so that anybody who sends people towards the video can also find the extra support okay. the group because that would be brilliant. Uh, and I can put those two videos in the comments as well. Thank you. So, so that people can see. Is there any other questions? Uh, no, I think there's lots of comments, uh, though, and um, I think... Um, I think it's just testament to how well you've delivered that presentation. Really. I think it's really hit home for us and, and joined a lot of dots, I think. So if people want to find out more, more Victoria, where can they find you? And also, uh, your, um, I know you mentioned earlier, but make sure you reference as well about your support group for professionals because it's an excellent group. So uh, Canine Conundrums is an international support group for dog trainers and behaviourists. There's over a thousand members in there. There's some very big name trainers in there who lurk. They don't say very much, Andrew Hale being one of them. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a really nice group. It's a safe place to ask questions, to seek support with career or CPD or case studies. Um, so that's Canine Conundrums. And then the um, if you want to find out more about me, I have a Facebook page, Victoria Cooper Behaviorist and Instagram as well. Um, so you can find out more about me on there and my work. I do um, share my work on there with different dogs. So, great. Right. Well, thank okay. you. Lewis. So, um, it's been a pleasure. A bit of a guinea pig tonight. To That's get... okay. You have to teach me the tricks now. Yes, I will. And um, uh, uh, I've got this about. I don't know if everybody turns up. There's going to be about eighty people, I think, coming for that to look at that. But um, yes. Yeah, so thank you so much for that tonight. So, just letting everybody know. Um, uh, just a reminder that bark season has has started. Uh, we had two amazing conversations last weekend with the uh, with the barks ladies as they self identify as. I feel like I'm a honorary barks lady at the moment. Uh, and um, uh, those two conversations were really amazing. They were just a roundtable conversation, <clears throat> sharing some of the thoughts about the barks approach and things, and um, some very powerful moments there. Um, the first of June is the first of the set presentation. So 1st of June, 9th of June, 16th of June, it's going all, all the way through June and July. 
um, individual presentations, a bit like we've had from you today, Victoria. The first one was with Saljania, looking at resolving multi-dog conflict. Excellent. And then the of June, we've got Salabi looking at the role of secure attachments uh, with case studies and that kind of thing. So um, uh, check out the file section in the group because it tells you the schedule there. <clears throat> we've also got Wendy Sunshine coming in on the 29th of June for another Facebook Live. Um, how parenting experts can can uh, support how we bring up dogs. So this is very much, again, making these connections. That's good. Yeah. About, you know, stuff. Secure and attachments. That, secure attachments and how important this stuff is. You know, I think, um, yeah, for me, uh, Victoria, for quite a while, actually, a lot of this stuff I get uh, that, I, that I get stuck into both books wise and studies is from the progressive side of child educational psychology. Yeah. Development. yeah. And actually we don't, it's not, a huge leap to make to join some dots there regarding neurological That's right. yeah and then on the 14th of june we're having a bit of a dog cc special with susan clothier lovely so susan's gonna That's come in my diary yeah so susan uh we're gonna really we're gonna really kind of um chew the fat on that one uh it's gonna be a bit not no no holds barred uh i think but also susan's also gonna um uh really introduce us to her new um fat system of it's called fat uh of um looking at um doing assessments of dogs needs really uh so susan's going to go through that so susan clothe 14th of june and thank you everybody for tuning in tonight thank you again victoria you're welcome thank you see you all soon take care bye